and the sand and mud settles out, particularly in the low places between the high points on the sea floor. Successive flows build up a series of layers. You can think of each flow perhaps be having been triggered off by an earthquake. The sand poured into the canyon from the beach having lain at some point in the canyon until it was triggered by the shock of the quake. The result in a flume tank is a thick series of layers that eventually level off the topography on the bottom of the tank. And the equivalent in the rock record is described by Dr. Tuzo Wilson. These beds, which are now dipping in this direction, we believe were laid down at the bottom of the sea. And at that time, of course, they would have been nearly flat. And uh, they've been tilted up into this present position by some ancient mountain building. Now, we can tell that this side, in this direction, was up, because each bed is graded. That's to say, it runs from coarse beds at the bottom, coarse sediments at the bottom, up to finer silt. And we think this was due to the fact that each of these beds was built by a flow of muddy water rushing out over the seafloor, perhaps down some steep slope. And the coarse sand was laid out at the bottom, and I can feel it rough at my finger. And it gets finer in this direction, and the last part laid down was a layer of silt. And that was the end of that rush of water. And perhaps many years later, perhaps occasioned by a, an earthquake, there'd be another flow. And this starts with the coarse bed, which is the bottom, gets finer up in this direction. And then some years later, another bed may have been laid down. And so on, we have a succession of beds. And they call these graded beds. And this property, changing from coarse to fine, enables you to tell which direction was the original top surface of the, when they were laid down on the ocean floor. On the deep sea floor, where those graded beds were deposited by turbidity currents, waves are clearly not a very important influence on the sediment. But on the beach, and generally in shallow water, Waves are a very important influence in controlling the characteristics of the sediment and the subsequent sedimentary rock. Once again, we can turn to a flume tank, in this case to study the mechanism of wave action. The waves are rather more simple in the flume tank than those which uh, bash on a beach. A small ball floating near the surface of the water behaves in much the same way as a beach ball would if you dropped it into the ocean. If you look at this in slow motion, you can see that each time that a crest, that is a high point of the wave, passes over the ball, the ball rises and moves forward a little bit with the waves. At a trough, the ball moves down and backward. And the result is that the ball describes a circle. And we can imagine the ball representing a particle of water near the surface, also moving in a circle. By putting weighted balls into the water, we can see what happens beneath the surface. The uppermost ball moves in an almost circular orbit. But the deeper we go, the smaller the orbits become, and the slower the water particles move. And finally, at a certain depth, there's no orbit at all. Clearly, a sediment that results from the accumulation of fragments will become deposited for one of two reasons, either because the particles are away from the reach of wave action, beneath the point in the form you've just seen where the ball was influenced by the wave, or in the opposite case, because the waves are simply not strong enough to move the particle. Their particles are too big and too heavy. So a good way to classify, to divide up the sediments and the sedimentary rocks which are formed of fragments, either sands or pebbles and so forth, is on the size of the fragments. And that's the basis of the classification of the detrital sedimentary rocks. 
those sedimentary rocks which are composed of fragments that are over 256 millimeters in size, in cross-section, are called boulders between 64 and 256 millimeters. That's between about 3 and 10 inches. The fragments are called cobbles between 4 and 64 millimeters. They're called pebbles. And between 2 and 4 millimeters, they're granules. And all of these fragmentary rocks are called conglomerates, so long as the fragments are rounded, as of course they normally are when they're pounded against one another. Between 1 16th of a millimeter and 2 millimeters in size, the fragments are called sand. This is the particular special definition of sand that geologists use. And that sand, when consolidated, will form sandstone. The particles that are smaller than sand, if they're between 1 256th of a millimeter and 1 16th of a millimeter, then that material is salt. And the resultant rock is a saltstone. And for material that's still finer than 1 256th of a millimeter, that is clay, which when consolidated forms mudstone, sometimes called claystone, and when it splits easily, called shale. So the basis of the division of the detrital sedimentary rocks is size, conglomerate, sandstone, saltstone, mudstone. The conglomerates are further divided according to whether the fragments are boulders or whether they're pebbles. So we would speak of a pebble conglomerate or a boulder conglomerate and so on. The basis of the division of the sandstones into their various types is different. They're divided according to the mineral content, what minerals form the sand grains. Here are three sandstones. This one we call a quartzite. The grains are of sand size, and they're all of the mineral quartz. This one is an arcos. Once again, the grains all of sand size, but some of them are feldspar grains, and they give the rock a pink appearance. The third one we call a gray wacky. It's a dark sandstone, once again, fragments, all of sand size, but this time there's a great deal of mud mixed up with the sand grains, giving its dark appearance. So the division of the sandstone sun is based on the kind of sand grains. Probably the most distinctive of the detrital sedimentary rocks are, however, the conglomerates. This is a Precambrian conglomerate exposed on the shores of Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories. Glaciers have rounded the outcrops and ground away the once rounded surface of the boulders until they're quite flat and smooth. From a distance, this conglomerate looks very much like a present-day beach, although, of course, the rock is 2,000 million years old. And not so very long ago, a float plane pilot, seeing the rock from a distance, thought, in fact, it was a beach and tried to drive his plane up onto it and found out only at the last minute as his floats ground into it that, in fact, it was rock. The conglomerate is formed of boulders of many sizes, but all of them rounded. All of the corners are no longer sharp. Some of the boulders are now being pounded out of the conglomerate by waves and are forming boulder and pebble beaches that might themselves become a conglomerate one day. A conglomerate such as that of the Great Slave Lake was the product of a high energy environment, such as where the pounding of breaking waves undercuts cliffs and breaks away rock fragments of conglomerate size, especially during storms. Boulder beaches, possible future conglomerates, are common in the coves and the bays at the foot of high cliffs. The rubbing together